let them know. on row. Okay. Maybe a little less. Okay. Because they had one surgically implanted while they were in there. Um, okay, so the talk is Earthco Earthscope Cyber Infrastructure to Access Plate Boundary Observatory Data and Products. So this talk was in the general Earthscope uh, session. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, EFCO data services, the operations products for archiving, uh, community resources that have been developed. Uh, outside of UNAVCO, the cyber infrastructure developments that we're involved in with our collaborators. So this uh, probably won't work because uh, one of the things we're trying to challenge ourselves with in cyber infrastructure is interoperability, which is something Microsoft and, and uh, oh, this one works. Microsoft and uh, Apple typically don't do well at. So what is cyber infrastructure? This rather uh, crazy diagram on the, on the left is something Stuart and I put together Oh, I don't know what, six, seven years ago, Stuart, with the IDV, the Integra Integrative Data Viewer, and it's tomography, mantle dynamics, plate motion, plate um, uh, boundary zone deformation from the global strain rate map, and all these crazy uh, looking uh, diagrams here on the left is, are really actual data models, and the difficulty of getting them there in, one, in a way that you don't require Stuart um, to reformat every single one of them. So. So operational cyber infrastructure is, is, is a, a term for the components, the machine room, all the bits and pieces of software that, that make data flow from A to, to Z. In the scientific usage, cyber infrastructure is broader than that and involves people, the technological and sociological solution to the problem of efficiently connecting laboratories and really generating uh, novel scientific results and knowledge. I would say we're not quite there yet on the latter. That's part of what Earth Cube is about and certainly Earth Scope. So we're working on the scientific application of while we build the infrastructure. So here's a, a diagram that Megan Berg helped me make for, the, uh, for our proposal and our presentation for GAGE to the NSF. And we all play some role in making this, this diagram work. This is the operational cyber infrastructure. And many of us are involved in the source on the left, putting the instruments in the ground or acquiring data from the space agencies such as ESA or um, LIDAR from the air or TLS from the ground. That's the source. Then the op data operations is the process of getting it from wherever it was into the archive. Then data products and services are generating, uh, enhancing the value in the products, creating new products from the raw data. And then data management and archiving, that's the, the final step of, of uh, creating the, the archives, uh, distributing data, and, and that sort of thing. Oops, I should have gone through it this way. So. Um, the products would be something like a RINEX file or QC, quality control metric. Um, some, of the, some of the data are processed on a daily basis by our analysis centers at MIT and um, Mexico Tech and Central Washington. And we provide training and software and, and tools. And many of you are involved in that, producing uh, um, classes and things like that. So data management is the, is, and archiving is somewhat managing the whole process but also distributing, and we have, and in the process, we've distributed some 130 terabytes of data and products have been delivered by NAFCO and its partners. It's actually, it's probably higher than that now. Once you start to add in the strain rate, it's recently discovered from IRIS. Um, and to ensure um, long-term of the curation of the data, and so we archive the data, which is about 70 terabytes at the time. Um, so almost twice as much has been distributed as, as archived, and then proper attribution using data DOIs and other metrics. And cyber infrastructure is really the part that puts it all, brings it all together from an operational point of view or a scientific point of view. So what are some of the products? So here's one that you're probably familiar with if you've been working with any kind of GPS data for the last 20 years. It's a time series, and some of you could probably just look at it right away and tell us where it is. Because if you see the trends in the north component on the up and the east component on the middle, and the vertical component on the bottom, you immediately know it's somewhere in the boundary observatory, it's, it's somewhere in the western United States, it's moving about X number of millimeters per year towards the northwest, and then there's this little disruption in the middle, we call it earthquake, with a post-seismic recovery. 
and some crazy things going on in vertical. There's some quality control tissues, some station velocities, which is what you derive from the time series. Once you figure out everything that's going on in that previous plot, and take out all the earthquakes and all the miscellaneous nonsense and water, then you get velocities. And this is a velocity model um, from the viewer, velocity viewer. Uh, GPS reflectometry, Megan talked about that as well. Uh, snow depth, by the way, was excellent yesterday. Epic. It, Vail barely made it, didn't make it back last night, but closed the path. You could use one of these on the, on the uh, on I-70, or maybe several of these would be helpful. Um, Real-time data, there's uh, about 430 stations have been upgraded to real-time capability. There are about 250 unique um, users. So every less than a second of your um, latency, you get a epic of data that can be processed, strain meter data from the borehole um, strain meter, and also, of course, seismic data that I don't have a slot for, um, long baseline um, laser strain meter time series that managed by Scripps, tilt meter data from ACATAN, pore pressure time series, SAR data from aircraft and from space, and maybe from the ground soon, um, airborne laser scanning data from uh, both low altitude and high altitude laser scanning. There's a picture with our collaborators from our um, from cyber infrastructure, but that's open photography. And terrestrial laser scanning, the measurements made on the ground. So it's a very diverse set of data where uh, anything from time series to velocity products to uh, spatial data. So there'll be some new products this year. Uh, the first is an event file. So that, remember that seismic event from the first time series. We're going to have a file of time series of earthquake events that have occurred in Lake Foundry Observatory. Christine will be getting that from Tom Herring and others. So that's the magic key to removing all those, those offsets and, and uh, post-seismic uh, uh, rebounds and motions that occur after the earthquake. Hydrologic loading, Megan mentioned that as well. Uh, this product will be out hopefully before the, uh, the uh, workshop. And this is the, the load, the hydrologic load that is estimated from NASA space satellites primarily for weather and snow coverage that gets converted into a load. The load gets converted into a displacement northeast up. And you see on the, uh, let's see, I don't know if this thing works. Nope. Um, if you see on the right, you see a time series. That's the period of time when the Sierra Nevada mountains were going up during a drought from, 1907, from 2007 to about 2010. Then the drought ended and went down. If you look at the time series from the Sierra Nevada stations from our archive viewers, you'll see that in the last year with the drought in California, there's a marked uptick in uplift of all the drying out areas. And I'm also seeing in some of the desert areas that normally don't show you any kind of loading. So there's quite a dramatic effect from the uh, recent drought. Um, we also hope to have knowledge products. So knowledge products are something that adds value in cyber infrastructure. So you don't just get a time series. You learn something from that time series such as, uh, I like to say every, every story, every station tells a story. And I know some of those stories, but not necessarily all the rest of you do. So how am I going to tr transmit that to you or the rest of you? Um, and then uh, real-time position from uh, GPS will be uh, made as a product. And then finally, the completion of the re um, reprocessing of all the PBO stations and all the 200 or 500 stations that have been augmented from Tours Network. So quickly stepping through some of the community products, um, University of uh, Nevada, Reno, this produces on a daily basis um, and on a five minute basis every hour, um, daily solutions for all the plate boundary stations, but actually uh, all the stations in the world that they can get their hand on. So it's like 10,000 stations a day. This is done completely outside, but using the, the, cyber, the operational cyber infrastructure that we provide, they are able to get the data, understand the metadata that you carefully put in so that people know when something's happening. It isn't an earthquake. It isn't hydrologic loading. It's maybe the antenna that's getting the scan. Here's the strain rate model of the Western United States. This is derived from primarily PBO. Um, the reflectometry I told you about, which is not just snow depth, but also soil moisture and vegetation index. So all these can be derived from the multipath network. Christine Larson at CU produces these products, and we distribute them in the UNAVCO archive. Um, the CORES network is used for um, surveying communities. So this is the, uh, the, the private and public surveying communities use products that are derived from the, uh, from the CORES network, which is a cooperative uh, network, a continuous, it's a cooperative, continuously operating reference system. 
and that has produced, uh, we produce hourly files for them that they use to distribute. You can see that our stations are the top um, uh, contributors to Coors. Um, also, there's products for um, precipitable water vapor from, from UCAR, uh, John Brown. You can see a cold front going across the country. Hazard, Megan mentioned some of the scientific applications, but it, and there are also real and imaginary ha hazards that are determined from the network data that are provided through Yellowstone, for example, the Yellowstone, Yellowstone uh, Volcano Observatory. And you're basically going on the left and the bottom from time series, campaign, INSAR data, integrated INSAR and GPS vector, seismic data, tomography, and finally some interpretation. And the hazards are, okay, if it happens quickly enough, is something happening or is it not? Um, Seamless Archive is a is, is in cyber infrastructure to add web services um, to data distribution. Uh, simp simply put, you could type in a URL and get data or get a product or get a search. Um, you can, as opposed to having all kinds of other barriers to viewing data. And we've had a number of different projects in SAR and GPS and in LIDAR. Um, currently, the most recent projects are EarthScope, uh, EarthView, Copious, SuperSight. So cyber infrastructure has been known to be a, a need for EarthScope, and there's been a, a committee that's put together. Fran was part of it. Mike Kern has chaired it. And this is the uh, strategic plan for cyber infrastructure. It's kind of our roadmap for how we decide what type of product to help with scope. The EarthScope, EarthCube is another project, cyber infrastructure, from the geo component of NSF to help them um, recognize their uh, cyber infrastructure in the 21st century initiative. And this is bringing all the various um, facilities together and the long tail of data from individual PIs and making it accessible for integration and distribution and stuff discovery and hopefully some of the modern science cyber infrastructure, the real revolutionary of, revolution in uh, ways of um, integrating data. Uh, SuperSites is another project that involves uh, distributing data from a finite number of locations that are hazard oriented, geohazard. Um, Copious is a cooperative EU um, US project to share uh, science um, products and create new products and uh, ensure some sort of collaboration and consistency across the, the Atlantic. Um, I'm going to be talking about that later uh, this month at the colloquium, so I won't mention it this morning. So in conclusion, UNASCO and its partners and collaborators are creating and advancing cyber infrastructure to provide access and value to data and data products for science, education, hazards, applications, and decision making. These capabilities facilitate the use of data and reuse of data um, and generation of new community products and resources like we saw. And then products such as EarthCube, Copious, Geo Supersites, National Laboratories coordinate these cyber infrastructure development at an international level and then broaden the use and application of EarthScope and related data um, and also um, the, uh, the leadership role of, of EarthScope is seen as a remarkable success that the rest of the world would like to emulate. My talk. Thank you.